Welcome inside episode 583 of the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba, alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains, and it's a feel-good Friday, but with the Senators, it feels like the front office is thinning out even more than it already was. And Ross, we've got two very interesting prospects to profile today, both with kind of cloudy scouting reports, but... A lot of potential upside. High risk, high reward. We'll get into all that, plus a pivotal weekend upcoming in the Stanley Cup Final. This is the Locked On Senators Podcast, your team every day. For Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Senators your first listen on this Friday, June 17th. We are free and available on all platforms, including on YouTube, where the best way to help the show grow is to like the videos by clicking the thumbs up, subscribe to Locked On Senators, and leave a comment. I know I said it's a feel-good Friday, but I want to know what your confidence level is with the Senators this offseason, because Pilsy, all we heard last week, there was Elliot Friedman reports, the Senators are looking to add to the front office. And what news do we get? They're losing their assistant GM. McTavish is out. Who replaces him? When and how many people are even working right now in the front office? It is a very thin front office. And if you're, if I'm looking at uh, Ian Mendez's article, there's only like three, three people really here. Like you've got Pierre Dorian, Tim Patterson, the director of hockey operations, Sean McCauley, manager of hockey operations, and then they have two other people that are in smaller roles here. But, like, that's just not enough people to run an NHL franchise, and especially one in arguably the most pivotal pivotal offseason in recent history. Like, sure, 2020 was a big one, but that was a big one because of the draft. This one has the draft and other moves needing to happen combined with it and the fact that this team needs to kick itself out of rebuilding mode. Peter McTavish had spent the last four seasons working with the Senators organization. He is going back to agency life. That was where he was when Ottawa got him out. He was basically brought in to be their cap management guy, their budget. Contract guy, yeah. Exactly. And he got credit from Artem Zub's agent for for finding him. Now, how much was that Dan Milstein maybe skirting Pierre Dorian saying, show me the money was the next sentence in that? I believe it was the night of the it was 5-1 comeback where Zub had that unbelievable breakaway goal. Yes. So Dan Milstein giving his client and, a little love. And that's an interesting move. Like after you finish a negotiation, congratulating the guy you negotiate against. I almost think, Ross, that's like a double sportsmanship thing. That's like it's almost <laughs> like patronizing, being like, Yeah, this this guy over here, good job, like patting him on the head. Like you got this this <laughs> this small deal done. And it almost seems like he's like, thanks for making this easy for me. Yeah, but at the same time, it was more, I think, convincing him to choose Ottawa because he was in those situations where it can only be a one-year deal yes. and the money's pretty well the same across the board. So it was more convincing him that Ottawa was the place to be. Now, how much does everyone's opinion change on Nikita Zaitsev if he played a role in, the, in all this? Mm-hmm. I don't think much. I think that's <laughs> just more tongue-in-cheek. But with Peter McTavish leaving... This is an extremely thin front office. Like they never even hired when they had to can Randy Lee. They never replaced that role. So now you're looking at a situation where some teams have two assistant GMs or assistant (laughs) to the manager if you're uh, Jason Spets in Toronto. But there's no advisors. Like they didn't even hire for the late great Brian Murray when he left and when Daniel Alfredson left. This was a, a former management team and now it just seems like Pierre Dorian. And we didn't even mention Pierre Maguire, yeah. who was here and then gone. So the winds of change are coming, and we could be in a calm before the storm situation right now. That's but the, the draft's like three and a half weeks away, though, Pilsy. Yeah, like this team has to be completely focused on the draft right now. But then after the draft, you, they got to be scrambling to hire people to help Pierre Dorian do some of these offseason moves, like signing free agents, like making trades. How about how about signing the players in the, our own damn organization to start off with? Like you, he's going to have so much work for him that hiring people to help him with work is just that's just added on to the work he's going to have to do. 
Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see how Pierre Dorian manages his time over the next few weeks. Because as it stands now, you know they have those huge like conference room tables at the draft. The Senators are going to be sitting at a kitchen table with the <laughs> amount of guys they have at at the, at the helm. It'll be what Trent Man, DJ Smith. I mean, I wouldn't even give them a coffee table at this point, Ross. Yeah, no doubt. One of those fold-up bridge tables. Yeah, we'll go with that. But hopefully there's hires coming soon. And Mendez threw out a few names. Like, I think it'd be nice to see Jacques Martin in some sort of advisor role, not on the bench in in forward. But they just need different voices. And they need experience. Like, Pierre Dorian came to Ottawa and was director of player personnel when he started. Or head of amateur scouting, actually. Um, And he had seen a couple other organizations. I think he worked in New York before he came to Ottawa, but they they don't have much experience. Like DJ Smith was an assistant coach and that's the only other role he's had at the national hockey league. He was a coach in junior and a player at the NHL level. Sure. But they they need more experience. They really, really do. And they took a swing with Pierre Maguire. He certainly has experience, but at the same time, it just simply was not a fit. And, And Ross, that's not even, they took a swing. That was Melnick took a swing right. like Pierre Dorian wanted nothing to do with that Pierre Maguire hiring if no if I'm feeling things out right and <laughs> then the are. problem here too is if we've learned anything from that ex- that whole experience is Pierre Dorian's not going to go out and hire someone who he thinks has a better resume than him because he doesn't want to get usurped in his own position he's so he's so- going to hire guys with or or women with less experience that he's like all right, you're 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 a low-level prospect. I don't have to worry about you taking my right. top-line center position here. You're going to develop in the minors for a long time. And that doesn't do, really, that doesn't do him any good because then in that situation, he's going to end up kind of having to train these people while doing his job. Like, I don't, I just, I don't see how the Sens are playing. They're not setting themselves up for success for this offseason. And if this offseason doesn't go well, we just rewind the tape and start it all over again. We're going to have years, uh, the last two years, happen all over again. I can't. I can't, man. And we need, and then we need speaking of guys with quick. experience in the organization, Ross, okay, you've got Jack, Jack Capuano, assistant coach. He's out there looking for other jobs. He was interviewed by the Philadelphia Flyers for a head coaching position. So anyone with experience is just like, yeah, I, I, it seems like people with experience are looking at the Sens like it's a sinking ship. And they're like, I'm about to jump off now. I'm not going to go down with this thing. And Pierre Dorian's the guy in the Titanic playing the violin. He's like, I'm going right to the end yeah, here. I'm here. Yeah. So I, I just, I'm starting to get nervous. Like I had, you guys know we're we're panic very, button. No, not panic button. Not panic no, button. Okay. But we're very optimistic on the show. We have have a lot of hopes for this off season. I'm starting to get worried. Like for Dylan Gambrell to be the only move, and then other and the moves, first move. Yeah, the first. Yeah, let's get this done right away here. Um, Got to get a 14th forward sign for sure. And, and the fact that okay, that's all you've done, and then the only other things that have happened are people leaving your organization and people trying to interview for other jobs. Like, I mean, it's a step up job, so you can't no, blame Capuano. I'm not talking about the movement for Capuano. I'm just talking about the idea that he's like, yeah. I'm looking elsewhere. Like I'm dusting off the old resume and I'm seeing <laughs> that one somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And I'm seeing if there's other options out there. So the fact that this is already so thin, people are leaving and I don't know who they're going to bring back. Are we available? Are we available for hire? We have to do a podcast five days a week. We don't, sure. we don't got time for that. All right. We don't Anna, got time for that. Olivia, you can give us a call though. We'll, we'll work something out. We can at least be consultants at some, some level. Sure, sure. Have- as, as long as they let us bring Bilt Bars along. With yes, <laughs> yes. Do you want to say a quick word from our friends at Bilt Bar before we get to two very intriguing prospects? And let us know in the comments as well. We want to know some names. Like we've heard Cheryl Pounder, and I think in the right role, player development, like that's kind of like a coaching type role. Because when you listen to her analysis, that's kind of what her background but why is. Why would she leave her job as an analysis? She's doing so great. Like I don't I don't think uh, – Probably a little more cozy, close to home, all that. But I guess, yeah. I don't know. She seems like she has fun on the show. I feel like she exactly. actually likes to send. So hopefully. I mean, I think it would be a good hire. But who else? Like give us some names in the comments. Like we mentioned Jacques Martin. Know. Like it's going to be so interesting because you know how Sens fans are especially with the way that the Pierre Maguire news, it's like, yeah, we want someone and then they're going to hire someone and it's going to be the guy, the wrong guy. 
Like they're gonna be like, okay, Garth Snow is the new assistant GM. <laughs> oh no. Mike Milbury is gonna be our consultant. Like, yeah. Not only do they have to hire and get more people, but Pilsy, they need the right people in the right spots. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to, Ross, today our uh, our sponsor is our good old friends at BetOnline.net. Yes. They are the trusted online sports book of the Locked On Podcast Network. They've been an OG sponsor. They've been the platform which I've been winning not very often and losing a lot more often in my parlays. But we're going to get back to that next season. I'm going to hash things out and do a little uh, uh, searching for what I need to do to change. But it's not just hockey, guys. If you guys were watching the NBA Finals, congrats to the Golden State Warriors. Hopefully you guys had a little shekels on them at betonline.net. They're the best spot for all your latest scores. Player props, performances, totals, odds, everything you need, you can get it at betonline.net. That's where you go to get your research done so that you can make smart picks. Check it out today on their website or on your mobile device. It's betonline.net, where the game starts. All right, Pilsy, and the games continue in the Stanley Cup Final tomorrow. And I'm going to get a levy lock in the mix here. Nikita Kucherov, anytime goal scorer tomorrow, kid just had his 29th birthday today. So we're going to kind of circle him as a guy who could okay. impress tomorrow. The lightning fell behind, and you can get that series price real nice and low or high. Low or high, same as up and down oh, um, no. when it comes at betonline.net. But all right, Pilsy. So overall, you're wor- getting worried. Not worried, getting worried about the front office being as thin as it is. I think that's a pretty fair feeling. If we're still in a in a holding pattern with no new hires, two weeks from now, when it's almost July and leading into the draft, are we taking the panic button out? Or can they even go through the draft with as thin of a staff as they have? I think for, for the time before the draft, it's going to be status quo. I don't think they're going to be looking to hire people during this period. They're so focused on scouting and, and getting all that together. So... I'm going to hold my panic button reservations until after the draft, and then I'll give them a week or two to... That's free agency. Like, this is where Pierre Dorian is going to have to be like the guy, uh, verbal meme, where he has like 85 phones in front of him. And, <laughs> yeah. and he's wearing like the belt with all of his phones. He, he's going to be stretched so thin. But Ross, I'm not too concerned for free agency for the Ottawa Senators. That yeah, Drew's that's... already in Ottawa, confirmed. Drew, yeah, yeah, he's Ottawa. already there. So the travel time is not far Boots for Pierre on the Dorian ground. going from Orleans. Um, <laughs> but a free agency, that's not the Ottawa Senators game. They've dipped their toe in there before, and now the player they made a big splash with is being moved for dead weight oh for God. contracts. Poor Evgeny Dadnov, not to go off on a tangent here, but 43 points? He was a 20-goal scorer, and he's being moved as dead weight for a contract in return. Yeah. And what no I respect. said, when Anaheim was on his no-trade list, it seemed pretty clear he was looking at the tax benefits of playing in certain areas. Montreal wasn't on it then, I would have assumed all of the Canadian teams, or maybe because when he made that list, he was in Ottawa, they would have thought, well, he's not going to trade me to Montreal. But can, this is the whole, couldn't he have updated his list? Like, don't you get to update know. your list when you change? But either way, I, I think there's something, the Russian players, I think, like living in Montreal. Maybe it's that European uh, vibe that they yeah. get there, but I, I think they, they tend to enjoy it there. Um where were we heading with this? How did we get on to getting Dadden off here? Oh, free Sends agency. Free agency. agency. Yes. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, yeah. So I'm not like, I'm not so concerned that like See, when. Pilsy, that's a perfect thing. See how you got lost there for two seconds? Now imagine <laughs> you're Pierre Dorian and now you don't have McTavish to get you back on track. Yeah. You, you need, need people. You need a partner. You need a friend to to lend a hand every once in a while. And that the thing is, the Sens aren't going to have a big splash this offseason in free agency unless it's with Giroux, which, like, that's going to be something that's ongoing and already in the works. It's not like they need to hire extra staff to take care of that. And I think they're going to they're gonna take their time hiring people because Pierre Dorian's going to want to have to go through with the fine comb, make sure it's his people. I, I don't know what's going to happen here. Like, it's this summer is going to be wild, and we need the Sens to start doing something. We will be with you every step of the way right here. Unlocked on Senators, where we've got all you need, whether it's the Alfie to the Hall of Fame propaganda, 
the RFA contracts we looked at all week long, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then yesterday we had Craig Medaglia on to discuss Alfie to the Hall of Fame. Of course, all this while our countdown is ongoing, and if you missed any of our more than 50 draft profiles so far, we've cut them all up separately, thrown them up on YouTube, so that if one prospect piques your interest, you can go find and listen to our profile of them. Today has two boom or bust prospects, and we're going to start out at number 12. All right, coming in at number 12 on our Locked On Senators draft rankings, we're going to Liga for a Finnish-born player, Finnish-raised player, but with Canadian roots, it's Brad Lambert. Our first Finnish player we're covering this entire time, Ross. Like we were talking about it off air. That is wild to think of that it took this long to get to a Finnish player. Yes, we've got one more coming up. But when it comes to Brad Lambert, if we were having this conversation last year or the year before and we're looking ahead two, three years down the road, kind of like it was last year with another Finn with Aturati, Brad Lambert was in serious consideration to be the first overall pick in this draft, we have him here at 12, but Pilsy, that is not locked in stone, locked in stone, written in stone. I combined two sayings there <laughs> as well. But look at the range on this. Tony Ferrari has him at fifth on his list. Craig Button has him at 27. Chris Peters at 25, elite prospects, and Corey Prodman at 14, and Bob McKenzie at 11. Scott Wheeler has him at eight. On his list. So that's an average of 14.86. Pilsy, he was unbelievable at the World Juniors, but pretty lackluster everywhere else. Yeah, and this is one of the things that has been a big uh, struggle for Lambert is he started off, like you mentioned, if we're talking about him a, a year ago, we're, we're thinking he's going to be a massive um, riser in the draft. And he's got good size. He's at six foot one, 183 pounds. So he's got the frame that you're looking for here. But the issue is he had so many raw skills up front from an early age. And that's apparent by looking at his elite prospects. Like he started playing in uh, Liga in 2019-2020. So He's had pro experience for a while here, but the issue is all these scouts were enamored by the raw skills and are like, imagine when he gets to his draft year, when he has two years of development, how much more he's going to grow. Yeah, he hasn't done that growing. It <laughs> seems like he's been plateaued at the same spot as he was those years ago. And that's the boom that these scouts were hoping for, expecting, especially a guy playing pro so early and it's seemingly comfortable playing pro that early, but Unfortunately for Brad Lambert, it hasn't happened. And it hasn't happened so much that they he was moved from JYP. He only played 24 games there to the Pelicans, and hoping moved, it would increase his offense. And it did. He was moved back. He was moved yeah. back to the Pelicans. Like, this guy's moved yeah, back. Yeah, he, start, he started with the Pelicans. That was his, like, childhood program, as they do overseas. They have guys early, and they go through the program. But then he went to JYP Ross, and now he's back yeah. to the Pelicans. Yeah. Yeah. Does that mean... People want him, or people don't. And want he even him. had another team mixed in there. Uh, I don't. I'm not familiar with this team at all. But H I F K. Okay. That's where he got his first taste of the of Liga. Four games, two assists, and then he went to JYP. Didn't work out there, and then he went back to the Pelicans uh, this season. And the numbers are very underwhelming for the for the listeners who aren't seeing the graphic on YouTube here. 49 games played total this year in Liga between JYP and the Pelicans. Four goals, six assists. That's good for 10 points. That's actually, Ross, that's a decrease from last year where he had 46 games and 15 points. So this is what I'm talking about. Like, it doesn't seem like he's growing. It seems like he's plateaued and maybe even decreasing a little bit here. But then against his own age group was dominant at the World Juniors. He had half Very as dominant. many points all season long in two games at the World Juniors than he did in 49 games. In Liga action, he's a centerman whose best attribute, Pilsy, is skating. He was voted the Speed. best straight line skater in this draft from elite prospects. And they're not even the highest on him. They have him at 14. So they see all these warts in his game, but still credit him as being the best straight line skater, the second best four-way mobility, and the second best transition forward in this draft. He's the type of player who's a one-man breakout. And I love their shades of for this player. 
They've got him as Matthew Barzell in terms of his skating, his ability to cut on his edges. He is he's a great skater. It's just can he piece the the brain, feet, and hands all together at the same time? And that's the thing. Anytime you have a skater as good as him, he's gonna garner attention, and you're gonna say, "Wow, that's a skill that he holds above most, if not all, players in this draft class." And you gotta respect that. And he's been able to skate this efficiently at a pro level. So that's huge. Scouts, they take that in their mind for sure. Now, Ross, when I was watching um, highlights of him, watching the EP uh, scouting videos of him, what I kept noticing is he just keeps trying to force fancy plays and he has it in his head. Like it's almost like, like savior complex, right? He's like, I'm so good. I have all these skills. Unfortunately, I can't rely on my teammates. They're just not where I'm at uh, skill wise. So I'm just going to do everything myself. And he forces things himself. And once in a while, that's going to work. But then he backs himself into a corner and he tries to get out of the corner by himself. And his teammates are like, okay, should we just go for a change and let you handle this or what's going on here? And he's constantly turning it over. And sure, those skills are going to get him far. But then in the pros, like eventually teams are going to catch on to him. They start double teaming him. He can't um, escape everyone. And his teammates are just left frustrated. And it's it, it's not working out for him. And then what he does is next shift, he tries to force it even harder. He's like, okay, last time when I did it all on my own, it didn't work. I'm going to do even more on my own this time. And that doesn't fly in the pros. Like you mentioned up against his own age group, he dominates because you can do that in the junior levels and up against kids. But up against men, you're going to get figured out. You're going to get out muscled and you're going to get outsmarted. And that's what it seems like keeps happening to Lambert. You know what Ali Prospect says here? He is less than the sum of his parts. You know, you always hear like, oh, he's more than the sum of his parts. The exact opposite for him. David yep. St. Louis from Elite Prospects saying Lambert abuses his skill yeah. to the utmost degree. That's that's what I'm talking about. Like, he's just all. overusing all that skill. Like if what, like just chip it off the boards and chase it for once or like pass it off to a, a forward that's trailing behind you. Like he just, he doesn't do these things. And I, I think... Again, my knowledge on how they develop players overseas is very limited, so I, oh, I don't we'll know. Get but to off. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I need to do more scouting trips to Finland. Uh, that's very <laughs> apparent here. But it just seems like they they toss him into the pro league too soon. Like I th- even though he was dominating, like. Um, the U20 in 2019, 2020, mind you. So a couple of years ago, he played in the U20 league in 42 games. He put up 38 points. So they're like, obviously this kid is above this level. Let's bump him up to the pros. But I think he could have used a little bit more time, even if he's dominating, even if maybe he's ready for the next step, just a little more time in his own age group. So he can focus on other things and he doesn't have to rely on his massive skills like his skating to be effective in the pros. It would have helped round his game out a little more in my opinion. Yeah, I want to get one more quote from Elite Prospects in. I love this one here. Quote, there's a lot of work ahead for Lambert and whichever team drafts him, for whatever team drafts him, but the payoff could be so rich that any team that passed on him from about third overall onwards could regret this decision for more than a decade. So kind of like Barzell, right? Like teams that passed on Barzell, and that was the Bruins' triple first rounder draft, right? Like, they're probably looking at Barzell in a similar place. How do we let him drop so far? Kyle Connor, too. I mean, yeah. Thomas Shabbat. We could do a whole episode on uh, how they ruined that draft, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, hey, the Sens got the the spoils there, getting Shabbat after Barzell and Connor were off the board. But when it comes to the style of play, think Matthew Barzell in terms of being able to use his feet. Yeah. and Like, all the skill is there. And with Barzal, we've seen up and down at the NHL level. There were a couple of years, this one included, where it just didn't click. And you're like, wait, but he has so much skill. How is he not being able to produce? And then with Lambert, I mean, it's a little more obvious why he hasn't been able to do it. And the whole thought was that he was going back to his childhood program so he'd get more opportunity. Turned out to be the opposite. He got less ice time and less results. So just a tough, tough couple of years. I was going to say tough year, but tough couple of years. For Brad Lambert, he's probably so rattled the World Juniors got canceled because he yep. lights up that tournament for longer than just two games, and we're probably looking his stock a little bit higher than it was right now. Well, I've got think- I've got him at one and a half stars though, Pilsy. Like I I Oof. don't think this is I don't think this is a Senators type player at all. I just don't see a fit for it at all. And if some people are like, no, they need dynamic skill, but no. one and a half—that's your lowest rank. Lowest yet, yeah. 
Okay. Especially at this range. Like there's there's just so many players that I'd rather. This is not both these guys today are not sends type players in my opinion. Yeah, that and that's fair. And you mentioned how if he got to pop off at an international level more, how what that would do for his stock. Look at your eye Slavkovsky. And I'm not right. saying Slavkovsky didn't excel non-internationally, but I'm just saying look at the boost he got from popping off in uh, a couple of tournaments that were international. It's massive. Yeah. So I I am definitely higher on Lambert than you. One and a half stars. That's uh, that's very low. I, I think the thing is, is he the best prospect right now? No. God, no. But you don't always draft. I mean, Fair. no. You don't draft players based on where they are now. And I want the best player right now. You draft them based on their projection and where you see them going. And Anytime you have a guy that can skate like Brad Lambert, I think it's going to take time. I think it's going to be one of those things where he's going to be a disgruntled young prospect. He's going to be like, I'm so much better than this. I don't need to be doing these uh, these dump and chase drills or like simple things like that. And coaches are going to have a hard time reining him in. And maybe I, I don't know him as a person, obviously. So maybe I'm just spitballing here and making uh, poor assumptions. But I feel like it's going to be tough to get him where you want him. But when he's there... There's just too much skill to pass up, and skating is such a big part of this league that I, I really value where his skills are here. So I got him at three and a half stars. Okay. I don't think I don't think the Sen should take him at seven. If there was a trade down scenario and he's still there, maybe you try to take a big swing because Ross, he's a center, but this guy should be playing the wing. Like he he doesn't play well off the puck. He just has straight line speed. He he's not a great uh, give and go type player. He's the kind of guy where the center gives it off to him in the neutral zone and he just blasts by everyone and takes it into the ozone here. So I think he could be a good winger and match like it put him on a line when he figures his game out with Tim Stutzel and Drake Batherson. Holy crap, that's looking real good. So I give him three and a half stars, but yes, I do see the red flags and I understand it, but this is your home run type swing. Either we're going to completely miss on it and look like an idiot or it's going into the second deck. Right. I just think that because of what happened last year, they they got to, you know, rein it in here. And but the Tyler Boucher stadium. pick was not a home run swing. No, but when you do that, I think you need, you need this prospect, especially if and when Sanderson and Pinto are completely considered graduated this year from the prospect pool, that becomes thin. And yes. does Brad Lamb, like, he's just such a wild card. I need someone who I can guarantee throw in that top three if they do select at seven, even like the top one, if Pinto. And, like, you need a better prospect than Ridley Gregg. And would would Lambert jump ahead of him right now, today? Maybe. I can see the argument for it, yeah. but there's just so many, so many red flags for me. And December 19th birthday, 2003, he's a right shot centerman who could play right wing at the next level. All right, coming in at number 11 on our Locked On Senators draft rankings, we are going back to Russia, to Magnitogorsk in particular, with an average of 13. We've got at 11th, Denila Yurov. Your thoughts on the big sniper from Russia? It's so funny these two are paired together, Ross, because there's some similarities here. Because um, Danila Yurov, he plays over in Russia. And I, I, should I get into my uh, KHL rant right now? Or let's, no. let's profile him a little bit, and then I'll get into that. Get the profile done here. There's yes. the card. And then let's get it to Wind me up a little, and then I'll go here. Yeah, yeah. well, that, so, bo that bottom banner, I think, says it all. Yes. If you're watching on YouTube, that bottom banner, if you're listening, sorry, uh, the bottom banner says zero, I repeat, zero points in 41 KHL games. Now, that's regulation and playoffs. Not, I mean, I feel like that emphasizes things rather than, like, softens it, but... Uh, He's a six foot one, 178 pound um, right winger, left shot, classic Russian sniper. And uh, the rankings, uh, I'll let you go over the rankings, Ross, here, but they, they are very telling how there's up and downs for this player here. Yeah, 100%. And when you look at the Russian factor, I'd say he probably ends up going late teens, early 20s versus at the high end of this because yep. there are a lot of scouts who have him in the same range. Like Bob McKenzie's at eight, Craig Button and Chris Peters are at 11. Scott Wheeler's at 12. I forgot to mention Corey Pronman at 10. So that's all bumped pretty tightly together. And then Elite Prospects is all the way down at 23, just lower on him 
in general. With Magnitogorsk in the MHL, so that's the junior league in Russia, 23 games, 13 goals, 23 assists, good for 36 points with eight penalty minutes mixed in there as well. What do you like about this player most? Ross, this is a tough question for me because from all the scouts we look at, like I, I use Wheeler, Pronman, uh, I watched a video on him uh, from Will Scouting, McKean's. There's so many elite prospects. There's not one defining thing that I could find about Europe that I'm like, yep, that's his thing. That's why he's so high rated. I think it's more, it's the opposite of Lambert, right? Like he, uh, Europe is, I'm going to butcher this saying, but he, he is, the sum of his parts are better than each part individually. Did I get that one right? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. So that, like, he's he's a more well-rounded guy that I think scouts are, are thinking and projecting that can play a pro game safer than Lambert. Like, he's going to be able to hang with the pros just because he's got a better, well-rounded game. I'm I'm fairly low on Yurov here, so I don't have a whole lot much more here, Ross. He's able to make simple passing plays, and he keeps the puck moving, which is great. EP mentions how he's a powerful skater with good stride mechanics, because they love their stride mechanics. And he works he works well uh, defensively for pucks. That's, that's kind of all I have about him. Like, he is such a clouded prospect. Yeah, he certainly is, but I would say well-rounded is a fair way to have him it's funny in the final game report from elite prospects with david st louis who's coming up soon on this show uh D- david st louis said in one of the games he showed his handling skills multiple times including a sequence to start the game where he won the zone beat a defender one-on-one by passing the puck behind him and then stick lifting him as he tried to get it before passing to a teammate few players in the draft can do that actually maybe only brad lambert so again a little comparable there with the the man we just profiled so High risk, high reward for me. I don't even know when and if he'll come over. I think he could be one of those Russians that stays in uh, in the program he's in right now, which he's grown up in for at least two or three years. So a project even just from that. But then when you look at kind of the raw tools of his game, you're like, all right, like, is there that much upside? Because he was a guy, again, just like Lambert, who two years ago, you're in the conversation as a top five pick. And now you're looking at more of a teen. So I like my prospects, and I know the Senators do too, where as they get closer to the draft, you know that it's in the back of their head too, right? So they have that cherry dangling in front of their, or the carrot dangling in front of their their face, and they're trying to get to it, get to it, get to it, work harder, play better, up the ante. So the prospects that dwindle, to me, like come playoff time, it's the same type of thing, right? When everything gets ratcheted up, your draft year, your playoffs, you're going for the cup. I want you to ex extend your your game play better reach your potential and it seems like it's closer to these guys get to the draft they're falling off the wrong way yeah and, and i think now's the time for me to get into my khl rant like <laughs> again i fully admit i don't have full comprehension of how development of players happens over in russia my scouting trips there have been very limited my intel with uh with russian scouts and hockey players is very limited but this ross i just I will not understand. Like, he played so many games in the KHL, uh, 21 games in the regular season, zero points. So I was like, okay, I know KHL prospects. They're not playing many minutes. This guy's not playing many minute. One minute, Ross. I looked at his game logs. There's around 20 games where he plays less than a minute. I put the bar at one minute of time on ice and I counted right around 20 games where he did not exceed one minute plays. Like one shift. He has handfuls of games with just one shift, 36 seconds a game played. And what is the point here? Like he only played over 10 minutes in the KHL once. He averaged three minutes and 19 seconds. Now, Will Scouch in his video, he justifies these minutes saying when he did get out there, he wasn't doing much. And there's not, it's not like the coach is like, that was a good shift. Like I'm going to tap him on the back to jump over the boards pretty soon here. But what is poor uh, Danila supposed to do when he gets 36 seconds? And if he has one bad turnover, he's sitting on the bench for the next um, three periods. Like what's the poor kid supposed to do here? And he dominates at his own age level, but he doesn't, really get a sniff in the KHL and you mentioned he's a guy that's that could end up staying over in Russia longer well I sure hope so you don't want to leave the KHL with a big fat zero over every single stat sheet you've ever had so I'm sure that'll happen and yeah the 
the the issue with Russia right now, I, I think that's going to sour a lot of teams of taking a top 10, even maybe even a top 15 pick on them, just because there's a lot of draft capital you're putting into a guy that you're not really sure how it's going to work. But there's been teams that have taken those chances and they've paid off handsomely for them. So maybe Yurov is another guy like that. But for me, I don't see the defining qualities that make me think, oh, this could be the next Panarin. This could be the next Kaprizov. Let him develop in Russia and he's going to come over and dominate right away. I don't see it. And guys like Scott Wheeler, like Scott Wheeler mentions uh, in his blurb about him, uh, I'm trying to find it here, what a great word. that he's... That he's really, really into um, him as a prospect. Sorry, I'm not finding it, so I'll just move on. But like Scott Wheeler it. is really uh, enamored by Europe. Scott's a friend of the show again. So here we go. Boom. There you go. There's his blurb. <laughs> well, I can't find it there either. I was reading the same thing on my own screen. I appreciate the effort there. there but I, just the fact that Scott Wheeler really likes him and he loves all the strengths and tools that he has. I got no clue how to feel about your off. Here. I know like I, he's a tough I one. Got, I got nothing. He's, he's a really tough one to, to really get a sense of because you expect him to play well. Now, when you look internationally, he's played well at that level in the past. So how much are you putting into that stock? And for me, it's just a matter of, can he put it all together? Cause he's got the pro size six, 180, as you mentioned, he'll get a probably play around one ninety, And then, can he play in a bottom six role or is he a type of guy? Cause his best skills are the offensive creativity, the skating. Those are what makes him a good first half of the first round type prospect. But if he's not gifted a top six role and I'm not saying play one shift, like he got in the KHL, but can he transfer those skills and be a solid bottom six using it? Like look at Ilya Mikheyev, a perfect example of a guy who okay. came over and in Russia, he was a top six guy. Then he comes over here, but he uses his skating to become an effective penalty killer and then grew into a role where he was trusted more and then can create more offensively. And now he's probably set up for a pretty decent payday. Or is he going to be a type of guy who comes over like Nikita Filatov with all that offensive <laughs> skill, but doesn't do rebounds? But no, no. In all honesty, the compete level is not an issue for Danila Yurov. But to your point too, and the big quote for elite prospects is just like, it's clouded his judgment on Yurov as a player, this is from a Western Conference scout, being barely played at the KHL level has clouded what Yurov is as a prospect. He has a great combination of skill, strength, and awareness. Some team is going to be extremely happy with him and might even get him later than he should be available. They have shades of Riley Smith, and then Corey Pronman compared him to Troy Terry, two offensive-minded players. Maybe Riley Smith a little less so, although he blew up in those couple of years um, on the Misfits line there with William Carlson and Jonathan Marsh so, but probably more of a middle six guy. And at this t stage in the draft, if you're looking around 10, 15, maybe it's a safe projection, but I'm clouded on him as well. But I'll give him, I'll give him two stars. I don't think it's going to happen just based on the Russia factor, but I think that he's a little easier to say will be an NHLer than Brad Lambert because Brad Lambert's just so hit or miss. I'm just not confident in that, hence the one and a half. But with Yurov, I'll just go two for a sense fit because they just don't take players out of Russia. And, like, what – I'm trying to – in my mind, I'm trying to think, like, which team would be like, yep, that's our guy. Like, where where would you be in the rebuild – in not rebuilding, but where would you be in your franchise's state to be like, yes, we're going to use – a top 20 pick on this player like why would that be the decision you make and and again it's because i don't have a lot of info on this guy it's cloudy so i just i don't see like why would the sends take a chance on him for me there's two sides of this either you love him and you're banking on him getting better development options yeah aka think... playing more than one shift a game yeah or you're totally scared by the unknown and you don't like it i'm on the latter half of that i'm totally scared by the unknown I would not use a first round pick on, on this guy. And I got him at uh, two stars, Ross. Two, So we're both two stars on Danilo Yurov? Yeah. All right. Yeah. I, I understand why, but I could also understand if someone's listening, is pounding the, their screen or their, their steering wheel, just being like, no, this guy's, he's got that it factor. He's going to do it. He's got the combination. Does, of he, side he, strength. I don't know if he has that it factor because what is it for him? Yeah. Like I haven't yeah. seen any scouts be like, this is where he thrives. This is what he does. It's just kind of like he does this a little better than average. He does this a little bit average. 
put those together, he's a bit better average prospect than most. That's I will I, understand. I will say the earliest he goes is Columbus at 12 because it's their second pick in the first round. They've had success. They yep. took a player out of Russia True. there, um, Chinikov, just a couple of years ago. Or another team that took a Russian in the first round recently, the National Predators, who took uh, Askarov and They've had uh, Yakov Trenin's been a really good player there for them. And I could see them trying to go with a little bit more of a project uh, for the National Predators, who I believe pick 17th in this first round. So I have him still going in the teens, though, even with the Russian factor considered. It just might be a little later on with Danila Yurov. All right, Pilsy, we're heading into the weekend. The Stanley Cup Finals is underway. Do you have a parlay for the people tomorrow, or are we just going to sail on into the weekend? I do not have a parlay, unfortunately. My funds are uh, still a little dry, and I'm just gonna ri- I'm gonna ride the rest of this season out. But what if I could suggest anything? It's hop on a Tampa future. I mean, uh, I, I do have a, a couple. Of I got some futures. Yeah, exactly. Four? So yeah, I got four futures on Tampa. Um, now is the time. They always lose game one. Like Cooper's even said as much. They use game one as a all right. Let's scout your toes. this team. Yeah, like, let's see what this team has. And then we'll do a bunch of video. We'll do a bunch of ways that we can beat them. And then they just take it on from there. So I, I think now's the time to hop on Tampa. I still got Tampa winning the cup. No disrespect to the Colorado Avalanche. They are the most formidable opponent that Tampa could face in the com- in uh, the Stanley Cup final. Sorry. But Tampa's champions. Like, they're, they're champions. They're going to three-peat here. All right, there you have it from Pillsy. Last thing I want to send us off in the weekend for is will, Ooh. could, Ooh. should, ah. the Ottawa Senators hire someone by Monday to the organization? Should? Yeah. <laughs> could? Eh, probably not. Would? No. <laughs> okay. Well, hopefully you're wrong because I'd like to have that for Monday. But for today, we say goodbye. Have a fantastic weekend. And make sure you make Locked On Avalanche or Locked On Lightning your second list of the day. Locked On NHL also available for you on this great weekend. Enjoy the weather. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitan. This has been the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day.